20 million packs sold. Sainsbury's, Waitrose, Morrison's, Whole Foods. He was chewing a pack of Wrigley's chewing gum and we're looking at the ingredients on that gum. I said, oh man, there's got to be a better way. All of a sudden we had a confectionery product that have all these functional benefits. Yeah. So we have mints on airlines, we have mints on cruise ships, we have mints in, in coffee shops, we have mints in supermarkets, mints, mints, mints everywhere. We went from a profitable business to an unprofitable business pretty much overnight. Yeah. You've got the success story of exiting Peppersmith and then you've got the tragedy with Kuroa. Spoiler alert, we've shut the company mm -hmm. and the reason we've shut the company is the demand is not there. I knew pretty early on that you know we had a problem, pivot or die. Need money but you can't get money, classic. The thing that really hurt the business was you can be braver, but it's very easy to be brave no. when you've got a safety net. It wasn't an easy decision. This is really important for anyone who's thinking of starting a business. Make products that people need. Advantage of the seasoned entrepreneur, because you can just see, just embrace that journey. Welcome to Strategy and Tragedy, the show all about how to scale and fail in business. My name is Stephanie Melodia, and it is my genuine pleasure to interview some incredible entrepreneurs here. They all share their raw and honest journeys to help you avoid making the same mistakes they did and hopefully provide you with your dose of inspiration. Now, just before I welcome my next guest, I want to say a big thank you to you right there. Listening at home, on your commute, while you're pottering about, or maybe at the gym, I know that there are so many other podcasts out there, so it really means the world to me that you're listening in right now. If you haven't already, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on future episodes. Okay, on to my next guest. Mike Stevens is the exited founder of Peppersmith, the confectionery brand you probably recognize on supermarket shelves, in coffee shops, and in health food stores. Responsible for a total of over 20 million packs sold, Mike led the company from its inception to a successful exit, achieving over four million pounds in annual retail sales from the likes of Sainsbury's, Waitrose, Morrison's, Whole Foods, as well as establishing their successful e-commerce channel, which drove 30% of the brand's revenue. Mike is also the best-selling author of the Direct-to-Consumer Playbook and now advises challenger brands looking to scale. Mike, welcome to the show. Hello, nice <laughs> to see you. All right, so let's kick off with the headliner, Peppersmith. So what was the genesis for the idea of Peppersmith, first and foremost? Well, that seems like quite a long time ago now, thinking about the genesis, that that moment. But I think if we're going to talk about Peppersmith, probably take the, the, the leap before that. And um, this was, I guess, probably, it was my second proper job at university. And I always knew that I wanted to follow an entrepreneurial path. And a friend of mine was working at, you know, a, quite a cool startup. They, they, did, they had just started and they were like, they needed some more help. I was like, Mike, you're into this sort of thing. Can you come and help? I was like, <clears throat> certainly have a look. And, you know, lucky, lucky me, that startup happened to be Innocent Drinks. Wow. Uh, so what a place to start. So, you know, I was one of the really early team at Innocent and it was just a fantastic place to learn about brands, entrepreneurialism, you know, start, starting a business, all of the things, it was just it was just all there. So my plan was actually to be there for a couple of years because I knew, one, well, you know, I, want, I wanted to do this thing, start up, run my own business, but I didn't really know how to do it. So the plan was, let's come and join a startup which happened to be innocent, do it for a couple of years and then do my own thing. You know, little did I know I'd fallen, you know, you know, into this amazing place where, yeah, yeah, I could do all of these things and it was such an incredible business to be part of. So I wasn't there for the two or three years as planned. I was there for eight. Wow, but Over it was at always Fruit yeah. But it was, it was it was at Fruit Towers with these incredible people, incredible founders, an incredible team. You know, we all had so much fun. But you know, we also did you know an incredible amount of things, and we learned loads. So, so a couple of things uh, just with this pre Peppersmith innocent phase, really quickly. So one, just to comment, the power of connection, right? If it was some friends of yours who thought of you to bring yeah. you in in the first place, so that's awesome. But that's normal, right? With startups, you know, you're in with startups, you really, you don't have any money to recruit, or, you know, to do it, you know, to do it properly. It's always about networks. So really it is about, you know, the people you know. And I think, you know, at Innocent, that very early scene, there was always, there was a connection there, mm. you know, with, you know with, with someone. It was only, you know, when we saw we got a bit bigger that we started, you know, I think I was the very first person to actually use a, you know, job site 
to actually find someone. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. Wow. It's kind of a shame for the people who aren't plugged into these networks, right? Because I definitely wasn't when I was starting out. Yeah, I, I guess so. But I mean, I guess it's part of that entrepreneurial life. You have to network because, you know, you've got to find people out there who are going to help you. Mm. And that might be, you know, sort of just friends of friends or it could be, you know, sort of professional networks. So, you know, know what it is. But, you know, it's your job, you know most entrepreneurs are, about, are, you know, are curious generally and they're all, they've all got to be curious about people as well and then make those make those connections you, you know it has to be done do you think the case is still the same today i think so yeah i mean there's loads more tools out there right uh, you know the yeah, internet has changed things i mean you know this when i was it was a long time ago when i joined innocent it was 2001 you know things seem exactly. very 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 different there yeah then but you know i guess the same principles apply so but use use the tools i mean yeah. you, know, you know there's tools there um um, but you have to do things. It's it's really about person to person. You know, you can use the internet to connect, but you know, until you make the, you know establish proper relationships, what you have to do mm. in person. So you also mentioned you always had this entrepreneurial spirit. You always had that itch. Did you look up to any entrepreneurs in particular, or any entrepreneurs in your family? Uh, yeah, well, I guess you know, there's quite you know, came from quite an entrepreneurial family. You know, that's always had you know his own, own businesses and stuff. You know, he was sort of you know working class man who did lots of lots of different things. So that I guess that was always sort of in me but you know I was much more interested in sort of I, I guess making a change uh so when when I started at university I did engineering when I started and the reason I did engineering because oh here's, here's I can make a real impact on the world I can make things I can build things I can make a difference and it was only sort of I guess you know three or four months into that degree I realized engineering is really hard work and it doesn't actually pay very much when it gets to the end of it so I actually switched the business Right. So that was like, yeah. So, but then go into business and say, like, how can I do some really fun stuff in, in, in the business world? Okay. Love that you mentioned that because we will come full circle. We will talk about entrepreneurialism as a force for good and impact. So bear with caller. We will get to that point. So back to the innocent days, Genesis for Pepper Smith. Yeah. So, so how did it start? So, I mean, if you remember, you know, Innocent was one of the first brands that led a change in the food and drink category. So, I mean, the big things that Innocent did uh, it had, you know, sort of these amazing products, but they were healthy and they were natural and they were sustainable. And then, of course, they had this incredible brand to tell that story, you know, to separate them from the, you know, the other crap on the shelf. Um, but they, you know, they were probably the first and, you know, one of the best, if not the best. But, you know, other brands were starting to take note. And so across the, you know, think about your, your supermarket, you know, across all the categories, things were starting to change in that direction. So natural, healthy, sustainable, you know, with, with, with some brands. Mm. Um, there was one category that sort of was left dormant, you know, doing the same things that had been doing for the hundred, for hundreds, hundreds of years, you know, um, which was sort of, yeah, unhealthy, high volume, low price you're really rubbish and that's confectionery so um i mentioned that at innocent there was you know an incredible team of people there and you know and i confess you know probably the the last sort of three to four years i was at at the business i was trying to you know pick out who would be a fun person to go and start a business with mm. and there was a guy called dan shrimpton who was you know he was incredible he started off in finance he became an incredible marketeer which is very unusual mm. and you know he and we had this idea of starting a business together and we chose um a confectionery i think it was actually him was the first one he was chewing a, a, a pack of um, wrigley's chewing gum and you know we we're looking at the ingredients on that gum I was like, oh man there's got to be a better way that's so and that was it. So you know, the very first product was an all-natural um, chewing gum, yeah, you know, plastic-free chewing gum, which is amazing today. Like everyone talks about plastic, you know, plastics and public, yeah. public enemy number one. <laughs> In those days, we were talking. You know, we we were like, you know, did you know most chewing gum was made out of you know sort of the same stuff you make tires out of and basketballs, wow. and, and no one knew. And and to be honest, no one really cared. So, um, but that's that was our start. So we had you know natural natural ingredients but really importantly healthy mm. ingredients so you know our products that had this we used a sweetener called xylitol which is a natural sweetener that's really good for your teeth so all of a sudden we had a confectionery product that had all these functional benefits yeah so we started with chewing gum the real hero products actually and it still is of the brand is, is mints yeah so we took these you know these mints and the gum and we started selling into um sort of we didn't follow the confect you know you think about confectionery you think about sweets uh, you know you might find it in your news agents or whatever but you know our our targets were 
independent delis, coffee shops, yeah, you know, sort of farm shops, health food shops. That's where we started yeah. until eventually we got asked. You know, we've got some listings in like Waitrose and then Sainsbury's followed and Morrison's. Well, before we get into all yeah. of that as well, because that all sounds super exciting. Funny you mentioning about the mints being the headliner and the coffee shops. I was just grabbing coffee the other day and saw boxes of Peppersmith on the counter there. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so the mints. So the the problem with chewing gum, right, is a uh, yeah, chewing gum's got a bad bad. Bad rep, you know, chewing chewing gum is, you know, it's sticky and it's, you know, it's kids and people stick it under the tables. And that's the reason why a lot of like coffee shops, they, you know, they don't want to sell chewing gum because they, like, they don't want to clear it up. Um, so while, you know, lots of people have chewing gum because of the functional benefits, you know, it freshens you up and that's actually is the be- one of the best ways to look after your teeth as well. It was actually the mints. You can sell mints anywhere. Mm. So we have mints on airlines. We have mints on, you know, cruise ships. We have mints in, in coffee shops. We have mints in supermarkets. Mints, mints, mints everywhere. That and that's is so it. Yeah. cool. I mean, when you're when your consumer product is served on airlines i feel like that's literally another level isn't it (laughs) yeah we had loads of fun actually we we had our mince label so do you remember on this doesn't really happen anymore on planes but you know in planes you were giving out sweets you know when you come down you know where you were landing so we had our little packs of um peppers of mints a couple of mints in this really lovely little sachet yeah it was loads of fun i love that i love that and what i also just love as well getting back onto the chronological timeline here i love the specific story of Dan having a pack of Wrigley's chewing gum and kind of that also being a moment with the genesis for yeah. Pepper Smith, right? Yeah, no, he was, he was like this. He's like, can it be done? And we found the thing called Chicle, which is the what gum used to be made out of. And then I found a manufacturer. Oh, it's so hard to find a manufacturer. There's not many chewing gum factories around, let alone, you know, the deal is with factories generally is they like to make more of what they already make. So if you go to them and say, oh, we're a startup and you, we want you to do things completely differently. It's too much of they're, a They're like, why, why would we want to do that? Right. Um, so you have to find, you know, a factory with the same, I guess, the same worldview. And we found one up in, up in Finland, funnily oh. enough. Finland are much more attuned to sort of nature mm. and health. So we, we found one up there and, and that was the start of it. I love that you were in this entrepreneurial ecosystem over at Fruit Towers. The last few years, you were sort of keeping your eyes open for potential team members, co-founders. What was it about Dan back then, like rewinding the clock, that you thought would make him a good co-founder? Well, he was a good mate, yeah, first first and foremost. But what we had, we had these really complementary skills. You know, he was very... Um, very, very creative, you know, it's in that, in that marketing world, you know, I, I was very sort of, you know, numbers driven, you know, and you need that two together. But, you know, between us, actually, we shared loads of values. You know, I remember Dan actually being quite nervous, you know, it's like, oh, I, is Mike going to just like sort of just be down on all my marketing ideas? And it's like, no, it's you completely into them. And we, we, and we, you know, we sort of shared that creative vision. Yeah. And to the point, actually, and one of the things that happened, um, you know, in that Pepsin journey is after about four or five years, actually, Dan stepped off the bus. Uh, he had some other things going on and, you know, and um, we, we needed to make some changes within the business. And it was actually his wife who says, you know, who was Irish, is like, I really want to go and live in Ireland. It's like, Mike, if we want to change things up, now's the time. Um, so he went off to Ireland. So it, it, then, you know, I took over, you know, sort of all marketing finance everything i i had the whole lot wow. but that actually that but that was actually very easy for me to do because you know essentially we created this thing together yeah. right so just to clarify you did you then become the solo founder, solo solo founder the majority yes. shareholder CEO, at that point? yeah did you consider bring someone else in or is having a uh, no, founder or uh maybe but i had this great team around me yeah, already you know, it was, yeah it was you know we were we had so again a bit like you know we were <sighs> I don't really want to compare this to Innocent, but, you know, it felt like, you know, was in some respects we were a mini, mini Innocent in terms of, you know, we had, you know, I guess similar sort of brand values, but also we did have this great team of people as well. Yeah. You know, and we had some incredible people through the door. Yeah. You know, some stayed longer in the journey, some some didn't. But, Amazing. yeah, but, you know, a real mix of, of different types as well. So it sounds like that wasn't the tragedy that it could have potentially become with your co-founder parting uh, because you already had the team around you. Definitely wasn't tragic because it was planned it, right. you know we we were in this together and we and we wanted to make the most and and the reality was and and this is really important you know for anyone who's thinking of starting a business you know to scale a business to the point that it can actually sustain a team of people including paying the founders and you know a salary you can live off is really quite tough mm. and we were at the point where actually we both had young families it's like actually this as a job 
this is a really lousy way to make a living because we didn't it didn't pay very much because you're investing all the profits back into back into growth right so you know we made this pragmatic view as well as like you know you know we i guess as founder the you know business needs to pay us more but it couldn't pay pay two people you know a proper right. salary so you know all these things came together at once so it's like you know he was, you know, very keen to go to Ireland and, um, you know, the business needed to, you know, have more money in it so we can, you know, support the team, which obviously I was part of, um, which is why, you know, and this is the reality. One of the one of the reasons we see the founder, I guess, landscape made of you know, sort of privileged white men normally is because they can afford for a business to not pay them very well for quite a long time. Mm. Why is that? Because they've built up a buffer, they've secured enough financial. Are you just like you, you know, you, the risk you, tolerance, the risk tolerance, you know, something about to fall on, and also, you know, how much, I guess, how much resources you have outside your income. Mm. So, what do you yeah. mean specifically? Resources how much ha- outside of your income. So how much a business can pay you? You know, for most for most founders, you know, it's very normal. And this is, you know, it can be a real sore point with like VCs. It's like, you know, how, yeah, how much you pay yourself as a founder. You know, some founders don't pay themselves anything. Some founders pay themselves like 20K a year. Some founders actually, you know, demand slightly more. And that could be because they just feel like they, uh, you know, they're entitled to it. Or actually, they've got mortgages and families and stuff. And actually, you need more. And it's a real, really tricky thing to navigate mm. in terms of how much you should pay yourself. But the, and the, the reality is, if the business hasn't, is not making any money, mm. um, or you want to, you know, invest, your, invest back into growth. You it's can't, a harder you, argument, you can't, it? you can't pay yourself anything. Yeah. So it's a, it's a really tricky dynamic. I love that you raised that point, Mike. That's such an interesting and important point to share. It's about privilege and it's about opportunity. You know, if you have privilege, you have more opportunity. So you can go and do these things. You can, you know, you can see you can be braver, but it's very easy to be brave when, when you've got a safety net. When you've got a safety net. You know, the, re- the real founders who are really brave are the ones who start from nothing. And if mm. it all goes wrong, you know, they remortgage and they do all sorts of, sorts of things. Yeah. And when it goes wrong, there is no safety net and they're really in the crap. Mm. You know, they're the real heroes. Mm. So I presume when you started with Dan back in, what was the year, sorry? So two, two, start- 2009, we founded the business. Yeah. Was this pre-family at this point? Yes, it was. Yeah. So you were kind of like two... Youngish yeah, white yeah. lads, so that kind of made it easier. Yeah, no, we, we, well, I guess we, we were two two young lads, but you know, we, you know, I guess, yeah, things are easy then. I remember, you know, yeah, yeah. So I got married shortly after, and then sort of, you know, had I had my first uh, first kid then as well, and it's like, oh man, this is all a bit much. But then. Yeah, it's just that most founders have the same stories, you know. Yeah, most people, you know. The, the, Businesses are generally founded, you know, with people, you know, you could be anything between, you know, I guess 20 and 70, but I guess in your 30s, that's a sweet spot. That's, but that's also the time when you, uh, when, you know, get married and have kids and stuff. So exactly. it's that, you know, it's that you're not, you're not unique. Yeah, yeah. One extreme to another, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> like, launch a business, have a baby, start a family. Uh, but, you know, that's, but that's, that's <laughs> yeah, everyone's yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. So Amazing. it's not mine. It's not just mine. So I know that you exited Peppersmith, but just before we close on the Peppersmith chapter, were there any kind of key inflection points in the Peppersmith journey? Uh, that you'd like to share so so many i mean we 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 got off to a great start um things sort of plateaued a bit and then you know we had a few ups and downs but that you know i guess that was all okay but the thing that really hurt the business was the brexit vote so we had all of our everything we made we made uh, in continental europe and the reason we did that is because in terms of i guess you know innovative food manufacturing there's just a lot more going on in Europe than there is in the UK. Right, you just, mentioned Finland before. Yeah, as well, so right? yeah, so we had gum from Finland, but we packed in Holland. We had packaging from Switzerland. You know, so we, um, you know, we were bringing together lots of different ideas because again, we were doing things in a different way. You know, we didn't want to just be, yeah. You know, a, a product you could already get mm. you know you might be able to source from the UK we were doing things very differently um, and you know because it was chewing gum and mints we couldn't we, we weren't going to build our own chewing gum and mint factory so we had to use other people so that's why we're in Europe but when Brexit happened um, you know anyone who was looking at the exchange rate at that moment in time saw this big swing so we went from a profitable business to an unprofitable business pretty much overnight Yeah, and that was really 
tough. You know, the business, yeah, we, we thought we went from, you know, we went for the classic startup, you know, but, you know, we sort of lost money and then we started to make money and eventually we sort of, you get to, you get to, you know, break even and beyond and then it's all okay. You can build from there. That was all happening. And then all of a sudden, oh God, we're back, we're back in debt again. Um, Such an unexpected blow. And then also at the same time is that, you know, you're, um, you, you can't invest back into marketing. So you've grown sort of plateaus. So if you go and talk to investors, they're like, well, you know, it's great, but you're not growing very fast. So you're not very attractive. It's right. like, so you need money, but you can't get money. Classic. So it starts to kind of kick off this downward spiral. Yeah. Right? So, so it was more, so my job at that time, Dan had already left. It was about steadying the ship. So, you know, to get yourself back into profit. So did some things, you know, reconfigure the team, put mm. some prices up, you know, sort of works out what we were doing with products and customers, change some things operationally, but not, you know, very big. Anyway, it was just like, you know, you, as a business owner, you have lots of levers to pull. Mm. You know, you're, you're, at, you're at the um, other control center. It's like, you know, what, what do we change here? So, you know, flipping the switches and got us back into profitability. But then the, uh, then the question was, what now? You know, we had gone from this niche sort of health and whole foods brand into the supermarkets where our competitors really were, you know, the Mars Wrigley's and, you know, <clears throat> Cab- Cadbury's Cross, Mondelez, um, Nestle, and all of these big confectionery giants, you know, all of a sudden we had to compete with them and, you know, and all their, you know, mega billions that they, um, they, they, they invest to build these categories. So we needed more money. So the the reason we ended up exiting is because we went for the process of trying to get more investment, mm. but realizing actually the amount of investment we were going to need, we probably would have given away a big chunk of the company anyway. So it had already been sort of seven, eight years into the journey. It was like, actually, right. um, you know, as part of that process, there was, a, you know, one investor said, I don't want to invest, but I actually want to, you know, quite like to buy the brand. Okay, interesting. So, so, so mathematically, it just didn't make so sense. So ma- mathematically, it was a huge risk. The other, the other thing the way I look at the you know sort of the entrepreneurial journey I see it sort of in seven year chunks you know it could be more or less but you know around seven years and so the question for me was you know after already doing it for seven years was I prepared to go for another seven year cycle right and I wasn't sure I was because I didn't I wasn't quite sure of um what things might look like yeah. in seven years you know what you know where it's really important that you have a strategy yeah and you have a destination um and either you, and you have to believe you can get there as well yeah. You have to have a plan. And I, I wasn't sure that the destination was there or the plan to get there was right and given away a load of the business anyway. So it was that that point when, you know, it was given the opportunity. It's like, you know, do you do you want to sell? It's like, actually, maybe maybe this is the right time. And that's the, ended up. It, it wasn't an easy decision, but that's the ending. That, that's that's the way things um, developed. Okay, super interesting. So really interesting how the tragedy, if you like, with Pepper Smith on the Brexit vote links to the exit story. Oh, yeah. yeah. And what I would just want to share with listeners as well here is whilst Brexit was 2017, is that right? 16. 2016, because I'm, because I was 27. So anyway, because that was 2016, what I want to share with listeners is actually there's a parallel in this story with another interview I did with Varun Banut, the founder of Magic AI, and Mirror, like your at-home personal trainer. He set this up around like pre- pre-pandemic, so a few years ago, so bringing it more into kind of present day. And any business that has these physical goods, like he has this piece of hardware, this huge mirror, obviously you have your consumer product, similar issues with the pandemic and with all these other restrictions. So don't think that, I guess what I would kind of, a word of warning to the listeners as well here is don't think that Brexit was like this one-off, that will never happen to me. It was back in 2016 anyway, so it was a while ago. These, you know, you can still take a lesson from this and you can still kind of prepare for these regulatory changes. Well, well, you know, you talk about black swan events, right? Right. I would say Brexit, and the pandemic, you know, pretty unusual given, the, you know, the, think about the last 30 years that that hasn't happened. And I think, you know, lots of business, including what, you know, some of the things I've done and some of the brands I help now are still suffering from, you know, what happened then because the economy really mm. is, it, yeah, it's not in, not in great shape, especially in the world of consumer goods at the moment. Yeah. It's not in great shape. And you can, you can link it directly back to, you know, that day in, uh, I think in June, it was in, uh, in 2016 when, uh, yeah, life went... F- from quite good to not so good and we're still there. 
Yeah. Okay. So very nice segue post exit. You mentioned about helping other founders. So you're kind of advising, consulting other challenger brands. I read that one of the things that you help them do, given the wealth of experience that you've amassed over the years, is help them to avoid the missteps. And that's also, you know, the purpose of the show as well, is learn from others who are a few steps ahead of you. What are the top kind of one to three most common missteps that you see founders make that you kind of get them course corrected on? Yeah, I mean, a big one always is product market fit. Is there, you know, do people actually want and need your product? And need that is actually probably more than want. If you need something, you go and seek it out. If you want it, you might buy it, you might not. Loads of things I want, I don't buy. <laughs> so I think that that's a big one. The second thing, which is is, is making sure your unit economics works, you know, essentially, have you got enough margin? Especially in my world, which is different from tech in terms of, you know, physical goods, you have to pay for those goods before you sell them. You know, and once you've, you know, once you build in, you know, you, your goods and your shipping and your, you know, your packaging and everything else you need to do to get that product from, you know, you to your end, consumer mm. you know you have to pay for that what's left because what's left has to pay for all your marketing all of your people all your other overheads everything you do and if there's you know if you're working from very slim margins you know you have to sell literally millions of the things and most people just don't do that because because you know there's not maybe there's not the demand but even if there is the demand they're not going to be able to do all the marketing they need to get there on that line of thought then would you say that it's easier to build a luxury brand or at least one that's got a premium price tag on it to build in that margin no because i've just tried to do that and i, I failed so, <laughs> you keep beating yeah. me to the punch on the things to talk about because i know we're coming on to that next no, but let's no, talk about no, that as no well. and you know it, luxury you know sort of everyday brand you know it's it's just like do you need that the, the problem with luxury as well though it's you know it's very driven by I guess intangible desire and how do you package that up I mean some people are very good at it but you know it's really hard to do so mm. but but you know I always come back to you know make products that people need that's going to help them mm. To more about solving that deep need than like trying to go down like a premium positioning where you can have higher margins well I think it comes back to these Two types of entrepreneurs, mm. which we can talk about, you know, entrepreneurs, but in, in my world, I'd say they need to solve a problem. And yeah, and if, you're, if you've got a luxury brand, what problem is that actually solving? Yeah. So I'm much more about solving problems, yeah. you know, helping people. And which is why, you know, like with Peppersmith, we didn't want to just do, you know, a another confectionery product with a, you know, new label on it. Mm. You know, it had to be a very new, very different product that mm. served people in a different way. The consumer space feels so crowded at the moment. And when I think about what do consumers actually need, what are your views on the opportunity at the moment? Because we do have now every milk alternative that you can think of. We have got, you know, plastic free chewing gum. Uh, I mean, the good thing about food and drink, right, is that everyone needs food and drink every single day. So there is a you can't defer the decision to to have food. Um, so there is a real opportunity there. Uh, so and it's just about making making better products. Where mm. so many entrepreneurs go wrong, especially like in the food and drink space, is they just go with another Me Too brand. Mm. There's not a reason, you know, they're doing something that someone else is already doing them better. Mm. So how is that possibly going to work? Yeah, there's got to be a new spin on it. They've got to be doing something better than you know what's yeah. already there. Do you have any thoughts on consumers not knowing the need that they need solving for them? So again, in the direct consumer space, you know, FMCG. Tony's Chocolate Only, of course, comes to mind. And I don't know how many people prior to them landing on the scene knew that they needed a slavery-free supply chain chocolate bar alternative. I mean, 20 years ago, people were buying Rainforest Alliance chocolate bars from Green and Black. So I think, you know, there is that awareness there. But what Tony's have done so well is they've been able to tell the story. You know, that's what a brand does. A brand tells the story in terms of who you are, what you're about, why people should care. Mm. And, you know, Tony's have just done that incredibly well. Mm. Okay, amazing. Founders, budding entrepreneurs, I need to give a quick shout out to a friend of mine who's building something epic, I think that you'll want to check out. Ash Phillips, founder of Rebellious Co, runs Rebel Meetups, an IRL community for the unreasonably ambitious, I love that term. These events are totally free to attend and a great way to meet people, build your personal brand and grow your own opportunities while helping others. Head over to rebelmeetups.com to RSVP to an event near you 
that's rebelmeetups.com and maybe see you at an event soon. Any other kind of missteps that you advise founders to avoid? Uh, I mean, I think when it comes to, yeah, it's, it's, we spoke about product market fit, we about margin, and, I, and then it's just about patience. Mm. Yeah. Which that kind of links back to your privilege point you were saying before, actually. Like, do you have the safety or the runway to be patient? Oh, yeah, and again, because what you don't know is when, when, when you do it, even if you, if you've got it, whether you've got a tech product or you've got, you know, a consumer product, it takes so long to develop it. And here's the rub. Even once you've developed it, it's not going to be right first time. <laughs> so you have to redevelop it, you know, and sometimes multiple times. And that just takes, you know, it takes a long, long time. Yeah. And potentially you run out of money in that process or you run out of energy. Yeah. So what is the investment market like or what's the investment landscape like on the direct consumer FMCG side of things? Because I am more in the tech world. And yeah. so I know that that is synonymous with like VC looking for a unicorn, like venture returns. Are there equivalent? I mean, we know you spoke about Innocent before. Obviously, they've got Jam Jar investments now. So like, are they also do they also have those expectations that like you need a lot of that upfront capital? You need that runway yeah. To give it a good shot. The, this is the in the consumer landscape, it's just so hard to build brands that are gonna be worth lots and lots of money. I mean Innocent, you know, it's one of the they have an exception. They was such a you know, a brilliant brand, a brilliant products. They were, you know, able to, you know, sell it for a lot of money. Most brands don't have that opportunity. So therefore it becomes in terms of an investment bet, in terms of the VCs, it's really hard for them to get the ten X, a hundred X returns. Which is why um, you know lots of you know, consumer entrepreneurs have to rely on angel networks. The good news about angel networks is there's just a lot more angels out there. Okay. So yeah, that's where most uh, I guess consumer goods start. If they become exceptional, then they can start talking to VCs. But what's also happened in the last sort of you know three four years, or actually probably just post pandemic, is the world of oh, but we're a DTC brand, so we're a tech company, and you can just you know, hey, so the VCs realise actually that you're not a tech company, yeah, you're a consumer hilarious. goods company, and you've got to do all the same things consumer goods. And what and the other thing what's happened with DTC, I mean the DTC market's very saturated now. Yeah. You know you can buy anything you want online. It's really hard to stand out. So if you're you've got a consumer good, you have absolutely sell it online. I mean I I still wrote a book about DTC. I love DTC. I could, I could talk you know we could do four podcasts about just D2C alone um, do D2C but you're also going to need to probably do maybe Amazon or some other marketplaces and you're going to have to do retail yeah. You know, you're going to have all these all these channels, people are omni-channel, multi-channel but you know your job as a brand is to go and you know help people and the way you help people is go to go to the place where they buy your product yeah. it might be on your website but it's probably not only going to be that yeah for sure meet them where they're at right yeah. so many people make that mistake of like they're going to come over especially with community building as well like it's a, such a leap it's like go meet them where they're yeah. at they're already um just on the angel piece really quickly in case there's any founders listening to this who are building their own consumer brand are there any like angel group syndicates that you can name drop if people want to google where to go to find some um, i mean there's loads of angels what you find about angels they interesting thing about angels is angels you don't get that many angels who stick around for years whereas vcs do it's normally angels who have a bit of money or they decide this is going to be the couple of you know the one or two years you know for, for lots of different reasons when i'm just going to going to invest mm. and that's where, where they get involved so um there are loads of angel networks out there. I'm not going to mention them, but you can you can just Google them or LinkedIn or whatever. You'll, you'll find them. But okay. uh, yeah, but again, we talked right at the very start of this um, chat. We, we spoke about networking. It's part of the process. Absolutely. But you know, that mo and most angel investors they do they're really supportive. They they want you know most of them have been you know they've they've been there and done it. They've been founders. They they want you to succeed, um, and and they also they still want to be part. I guess part of that entrepreneurial ecosystem, but maybe without doing all the work. So right. they, they you know they're 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 really supportive. So yeah. I, I think they're that's a great place to start if you need investment. Fantastic. All right, great tip for the listeners. So we mentioned your own premium bedding brand that you've just kind of closed the door on. Tell us the story. Yes. This is Kuroa. So, and there was, is you know, Kuroa, which sadly uh, is, is no more. So the story after Peppersmith is that I needed a bit of a break. So, I, you know, I started doing consulting, which I still really enjoy. You know, I love helping um, other founders in terms of, you know, building what, you know, what they're trying to do. I also wrote a book, which was, which was, you know, that was really fun in terms of, and that book was all about um, direct consumer brands, 
when I was building Peppersmith, there was um, we were doing lots and lots of e-com. We were figuring it out, you know, this was, you know, sort of 2010 onwards. It's like everyone, you know, was doing, how do you sell stuff online? And what really frustrated me, it was that, you know, we were sort of making it up as we go along. But it wasn't just us, all the other founders that I was speaking to. It was like they were doing the same. There was no best practice out there. You got you got real specialists out there. In our world, it was Grays. They were the real D2C specialists. But you know, as us, you know, multi-channel brands who are using how do we use the internet to, you know, to be increment or supplement or to do something different from, you know, what we do with wholesalers and retailers, you know, how, how do we make the most of this space? Um, we were just you know figuring it out on the fly. So I vowed that by the time I sold Peppersmith if no one had written the book for brands on how to make the most of D2C, I was going to do it. So, Amazing. You know, and sure enough, you know, I sold Peppersmith. All of a sudden I had some time. No one had written this book. So it fell on my shoulders to do. So I, I did that. So so I had consulting, did the book, which took a couple of years. Uh, that was published in 2022. Yeah, so maybe two years ago, wow. you know, um, in May actually so pretty much yeah where we are now um and then it was like okay what's the next thing you know let's go and build something new so I was you know just sort of thinking you know what is the, the next brand and I got introduced to the world of textiles and sort of home textiles um and one thing that you know was really apparent as I was looking at the textile market is in the world of fashion there was you know fantastic stuff going on in terms of not only material science but also sales and marketing and the way you know things were made and sold yeah you know, whether whether they were sort of sold in pre-order or that you know um how they treat their customers you know the returns policies and stuff all very very different to this world of fast fashion so you know so so from the clothing side there were a few brands out there who were doing some really interesting stuff then alongside that was home home textiles so in in the home you know whether it's um you have curtains or carpets or you know tea towels or whatever you know it's made of the same stuff you make clothes from but the same rules didn't apply and the big category was actually bedding so you know in the world of bedding it was all very commoditized and not that many brands out there yeah it was all very much 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 of a muchness all very um sort of price driven so you said why why not let's take all this um you know incredible innovation in clothing and you it's because it's the same stuff right and let's move that across into the home and create mm -hmm. a home textile brand mm -hmm. yeah that's you know got sustainability at heart but also quality and craft and i guess a, just a new way to tell the story yeah so we started the brand called Coroa, and we started in bedding we use this incredible material called tencel which is you know it's really soft and silky it's got all these amazing functional benefits and it's also uber uber sustainable mm. so you know so all of a sudden we had a luxury bedding brand didn't want it to be luxury but obviously it had a higher ticket than you know you the, the some of the cotton or polyester bod, um, bed sets that you buy from Dunelm right it wasn't that right so it was online um and so we launched in starting June 2023 so um just just under a year ago so we've spent the last 12 years trying to build this bedding brand um but 12 months sorry so 12 months not yeah, 12 yeah. years I wish it was 12 years, but, you know, the spoiler alert, I don't know if anyone's sort of seen my story out there, is that we've, sh we've shut the company. Mm -hmm. And the reason we've shut the company is in just the current consumer climate, the demand is not there. We were able to sell quite a few units, actually, when we are on sale, because what was happening as a consumer behavior is that, you know, how often do you need to buy bedding? You can either, you know, you, you can potentially, do you need it? And even if you need it, you can probably defer that purchase for a few months. And if you defer the purchase, you can actually wait to see which brands are on sale. Mm. So we could sell lots of products on sale, but the margins weren't there. So it means you can't invest and grow the business. Um, so it was just like, it was a brilliant product. I'm, we've never got anything other than a five-star review for our products, but it was still, the demand is not there. So it's time to stop. And, and the real lesson there, you know, we spoke about product market fit. This product, we had a great product. But the other side of that equation is market. Demand just wasn't there. And was this with the UK only at first? Yeah, well, no, we started, yeah, UK. So it was building sort of D2C and marketplace brand uh, you know, in the UK and using that as a platform to build from there. Right. You know, we was talking about it was never going to be D2C only. It was going to be multi-channel. But you need to, I guess, create some brand equity and also have some momentum to actually get into the resale. So, and we just didn't get the momentum. So, yeah. you know, I, I spend a lot of time advising businesses on their on their numbers and their business models. And it's like, you know, and when I was looking at my own 
I guess, you know, numbers and success. It's like, this is just not going to work. So the reason I clarify if it's UK only on the market side of that equation is did you ever consider trying it in other geographies? I could do, but, you know, it was just like you, um, I think the opportunity was similar in other markets. Now, I, mean, you know, I started to talk to people and I met, I guess I met a lot of people who shut their bedding brands in the last two years. And there's there's some lessons there, and it wasn't just in the UK. You right. know, it, it, so that was another Europe. indicator. It was another indicator. Right. It's like holy holy okay. macaroni, this is going to be really hard. Well, I appreciate you you know coming on the show not only because of the fantastic you know track record before Kuro, but I think specifically with this twelve month venture is the post mortem that we can conduct on this, and I love how you can do it with that level of objectivity. You can assess the situation quite honestly because you've kind of, you have the experience, you have that track record from Peppersmith and consulting others that it just gives you just that much wiser perspective to yeah. look at this. So I think for listeners, I always talk about doing a pre-mortem on your business, not to induce any unnecessary anxiety, but just before it does get too late, what can you get on the front foot with? So in your instance, just to recap the lessons you've already mentioned. So one is entering into a market where the frequency of that purchase, i.e bedding is not very high to begin with yeah. um what were the other lessons i mean it's hard you know sometimes it's really hard to know what the demand is especially around branded products i mean some brands are just really attractive and some are not um so sometimes you just need to be in market um and this you know we raised you know raised a little bit of see capital to get there but you know in the scale of it it wasn't that much money and it really was a market test and if you look at it in terms of actually we've sort of tested the market over the last 12 months and the answer is it hasn't worked. Mm. I think that's that's the better way to look at it rather yeah, than, sure. you know, we were going to create this amazing business and amazing brand and it hasn't worked and it's a, it's a catastrophe and what what were we doing? I mean, I, I knew, you know, if you think of the last 12 months as a market test, I knew after the sort of maybe three months but certainly six that we had a real a, a real problem mm. and i think this is a you know it's an advantage and a disadvantage of a seasoned entrepreneur because you you can just see mm. you, you you know when it's good and when you know it's not i mean there are you know as a i guess as a first time founder you have you know you have all this naivety yeah and you just plow on and plow on and plow on yeah sometimes that works out most of the time it doesn't. So, you know, we're, you know, I knew pretty early on that, you know, we had a problem. So it was either sort of pivot or die. Yeah. And there was no sensible pivot. So mm. while, you know, it's only now they've shut the business down, but sort of certainly knew, you know, into, you know, 2023 that, you know, started having those conversations with those early investors to like this might not work out. Yeah. And some of them were like, what are you talking about? But, you know, some are, you know, we're just really supportive. And, you know, one thing in terms of, you know, one of the big things that is out in the UK anyway, you have sort of SEIS and EIS relief for individual investors. So that is a bit of a safety net. So it means those investors, they're going to lose money, right? Don't get me wrong. But, you know, they are, the they, they are, they are protected to a certain extent. And so, you know, through, through that, you know, that process, like, you know, we've, we've got a problem. Let's get out before we get too far in. Mm. Um, I love that. Someone yeah. else on the show, actually, they said, I'd never heard of this before, but the frog story about a frog in hot water. Do you know about this? I certainly know. The, uh, yeah. Do you know the story? It's from apparently the book called Age of Unreason, where basically if you put a frog into a pot of water, it's just fine. And you start and you put it on the stove and you dial it up and it's just kind of like, okay, it's getting a bit warmer, a bit more comfortable. But then as soon as it's too hot, it's already kind of panicked and can't get out. Whereas if you were to throw a frog into a pot of already boiling water, it would just jump back out again. So this kind of comes to mind here as well, right? It's like you can feel you can that feel. water. I, and I think if you want to use that analogy, you know, I'm, I'm a frog who can see that the hob's on. I so that. I've got to get out quick right. before this gets too And this, hard. again, yeah. the other advantage of the seasoned entrepreneur, yeah. as you say, I'm fascinated by that idea of you know, where to draw that line between flogging a dead horse versus calling it quits and getting out before the water's too hot. This and I is, guess this is like what you've just acquired through your experience. But it's tricky. But, you know, yeah. I might have got it completely wrong because we had great products and maybe there was a way to get it to work. So you you never know. But it always is, you know, when do you, when do you quit? All of the best entrepreneurial stories are always like, yeah, it was really bad. Exactly. But we, but we found a way. We did a pivot. Right. or we, we just stuck to it. Yeah. All of those best stories. But you only ever hear the stories. You only that, hear those ones. Uh, uh, <laughs> the ones where it does work. Exactly.
for actually it, it doesn't work because the market's telling you that you know it's it's just not the right it's either the wrong products or the wrong time and you just have to accept that it's yeah like, okay you know so let, let's go and do something else but i think you know one one of the actually there's a great book a great book called the dip by seth godin if you've read his, all his books are fantastic but remember he's got this this book called the dip and it's all about you know really are you in the dip and you're going to come out the other side or actually are you just sort of you know you're at the bottom of the pile and you, there's no way out of this and it's exactly. you know it, it, it's just his viewpoint of trying to help you decide where you are yeah uh, and one of the examples that he used in this book you know which I read, I read when I was um when I was running Peppersmith was yeah like don't ever start a chewing gum brand <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's not very helpful Seth <laughs> Thanks for that. But yeah, um, so but you know, but they, there's you know, there is definitely the, the art of quitting is hugely underrated, mm. especially when we live in this world where you know it's all about you know Angela Duckworth is about grit and mm. just keep going and all the, all the stories. But you know, that's that's the yeah history is written by the winners, right? Mike, you are getting me so excited, and I wish that we had so much more time because this is exactly the purpose of the show. This is exactly why I created this because exactly as you say, you hear those stories, and of course you have that success. I mean, it's all subjective, isn't it? But you've got the success story of exiting Peppersmith, and then you've got the tragedy in air quotes, mm -hmm. which it isn't. But with Kuroa, where it, you you did a market test for twelve months, I love that reframe if you like, but I do completely agree with you on that. Um, sadly we are running out of time what I would just what I'm really curious about just on this note is knowing when to quit you just rewinding a little bit you said before being a seasoned entrepreneur with your data you've amassed over the years you knew you knew the direction that it was going you knew that this wasn't working what was it that told you it wasn't working were there any specific indicators was it more of a gut feel how did you know it's a combination, right? You know, it's a combination of internal and external, but ultimately it was about, you know, it was about demand and some of, you know, it's growing products. Some weeks the demand, you know, the, the sales numbers are zero. You can 10X, you can 100X zero, it's still zero. And that's, mm. that told me all I need to know. Right, right. Okay, good. Um, let's touch on entrepreneurialism as a force for good. What do you mean by that before we wrap with our closing question? Because I think that's still an important topic i'd like to touch on yeah least. and again it's you know it's something we could spend hours exactly. on. But let, me, let me let me just try and be very succinct i think first of all for me there's always two types of entrepreneurs there's sports entrepreneurs and then there's i guess creative or altruistic entrepreneurs a sports entrepreneur wants to it's like it's a game entrepreneurship's a game you know how can we make the most of this opportunity to be a winner and winners normally making lots of money right you know, there, there's, and there's loads of loads of sports entrepreneurs out there who are really good at the, they get the game and they're, they're they're really successful. And then there's those entrepreneurs who, for me, they're much more like you know explorers and scientists and artists. They're trying to do new things. They're trying to go where no one's been before. And normally, it's like you know, how can we make a product that's going to help people? You know, you, you sell more products that they, they, you know, they they help people, and that can be tech, it can be consumer, or you know, or service or whatever. Um, you say, how can we make the world? You know, it's that classic thing is like the world better tomorrow than it is today. Those are the entrepreneurs who I guess generally want to use business as a force for good, and you know, and by force for good, it means you still ultimately the best thing to do is make a product that helps people. You know, and they, they can pay for it. You can win from that as well. And But then you can take it a little bit further if you want to in terms of actually, you know, it's, this is not just about sort of maximizing wealth. It's about how can we use this to actually, you know, do more good, whether it's, you know, you know, giving, you know, profits away to foundations or charity or just the way you actually do you do business. And you know, everyone's got a different take on that. I mean, B Corp is out there. And, you know, that, that B Corp is not perfect, but it's just a really nice framework for keeping you honest in terms of if you want to be, you know, a, a business who is, you know, not just about, you know, that, the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there's, I'm, I'm, and pretty much all the founders that I know, um, I know a few founders who are like the sports founders, but most of the, you know, the founders I know, they are about solving problems. That's what they really enjoy. And you might as well solve it, you know, you, you want to solve a problem that actually is going to help people, right? And that can be from products, but it can also be, you know, I guess how the business, you know, fits in the wider world. So that's for me, that's what, you know, being an entrepreneur for, for good, business for good, as a force for good. Yeah. Um, it's all about, and, you know, Innocent was a great, 
yeah, a great example of that. You know, people think of innocent. It's owned by Coke now, but they still do so much in terms of the foundation and the way they source things and the way they do things. You know, it's a real, it's a shining light actually in this world of you know consumer products and you know, consumerism. Um, how yeah, it doesn't have to be just we're going to sell loads of products and we're going to make loads of money. Yeah, you know, the, life doesn't have to be like that. Yeah, I love that. It makes complete sense. All right, Mike. Sadly, traditional closing question on this show, which is one tragedy that's taught you an unforgettable lesson. So yeah, I, I'm in business. I, I, there's nothing tragic in business. There's lots of tragic things in life. Um, but you know, there are lots of things in business that don't go your way. I mean, I've got lots of examples, whether it's, you know, Brexit or, you know, shutting down Coroa. Um, you know, there, there's different things I would want to do differently. But one thing I would say in terms of, you know, a life lesson is that, you know, you've just got to just embrace that journey because one thing I really believe in is, you know, where you get to, it's never as good as you think it's going to be and it's never as bad as you think it's going to be. Mm. So you might as well just to sort of just go with the flow a little bit okay. and, and, and don't beat yourself up because if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you're going to make loads of mistakes. I love that. Well, lovely note to end this on as well, Mike. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I, again, wish we had at least three, four more hours to dive into all this, but we've covered all the main bits. So hopefully lots of takeaways and lessons learned for the founders here who were listening in great well thanks for having me on and thank you so much for listening really hope you've enjoyed this episode don't forget to subscribe and hopefully see you next time